Welcome back, everybody. Um, so we're on to episode number 14. So um, today's episode will be kind of a continuation of the last one. Um, in the last episode in 13, we just I did the introduction to hydrolysis, um, which had the following components. It had um, one we're talking about right now anyways, we're talking about the hydrolysis or the, the chemical reaction of something with water. We're talking about the hydrolysis of uh, soluble ionic compounds or salts, as it were. Um, and so we went through just a reminder of the dissociation of different ionic compounds, um, how to figure out the charges and, and the proportions of the ions and things of that nature. And then a, a quick introduction into the strategy of, of how you're going to determine if a salt once dissolved in water will produce an acidic, a basic, or a neutral solution as a result of it. Very general. And the, the underlying theme is that hydrolysis is all about asking the, the fundamental question, um, does this salt, when dissolved in water, does it create an acidic, basic, or neutral solution? And that's kind of the goal of this. Once you understand that, then a, a bunch of things result from that, as you'll see, particularly when you get to the titration unit, which is after this one. So today's class will be much more um, example-driven, um, giving a little bit more specifics um, and showing you, okay, in this situation, this chemical, why does this produce a basic solution? Why is this one neutral? Why is this one going to be acidic? So you're going to see a, a variety of different examples that are out there. And, and those examples that are provided to you are just going to be um, almost like a, a case sample for um, a, an entire category of things. Okay, so they're not the only ones that are going to do this, but it can, it's going to show you um, the thought process that goes into how you determine if something's acidic, basic, or neutral once that ionic compound is dissolved into solution. Okay, so um, over here, over my shoulder, you can see that um, there's just two things. Number one, quick review here, um, dissociation and the general strategy. And then we'll get into... Um, the specific types of things that cations and anions do and we'll go through a whole bunch of things so this one could be a pretty long one today okay um so let's start with um, from last class quick review from last class so ionic compounds um, will dissociate we're talking about the soluble ones so ionic compounds when you first put them into water the very first thing that they do is they dissociate into their component ions. And so I use the, the generic ionic compound AB in solid form, because ionic compounds, if they're not already dissolved, they're typically in solid form. Certainly at room temperature, they're going to be at sol in solid form. You throw them into water, the ones we're talking about are going to dissociate 100% because we're talking about the soluble ones and they will dissolve and dissociate into their ions. The charges of those ions are going to be determined by um, a couple of things, and you'll see what the charges are in the formula of the actual ionic compound, and then also recognizing what ions you have in there. So the very generic one, AB, the ionic compound AB dissociates into a single A plus and a single B minus. It could have been A plus two and B minus two. They're in a one-to-one -one ratio, and so their charges would be equal magnitude but opposite charge. That's not what's important. What's important is that the ionic compound dissociates into these two component ions, cation and anion. And then from a hydrolysis perspective, you're asking the question, do either of those ions react with water, hydrolyze, react with water to produce an acidic or basic solution. And if neither of them does, then the solution will end up being neutral and it will just be a solution of A and B, A plus and B minus ions floating around. So we have to learn how to go through that thought process of how do we determine what these things do. Okay, and so very generally, that's what you're always gonna do. 
is if you have an ionic compound and someone asks you, is this going to be an acidic, basic, or neutral solution, you dissociate them either on paper or in your head, and then you'll ask the question, does the cation act as an acid, does it act as a base? Yes, no. Does the anion act as an acid or a base? Yes, no. And you'll go through all of the, that process to determine what is kind of the overall action of, of the ions in this compound. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to do it in two parts. So we're going to look at the cations first. We'll do those guys first. Okay, so I'm actually going to go through some of the cations that do something. And if, and if we talk about some of the cations that do something, um, if you then happen to get a cation that isn't one of those that I go over today, then it does nothing then your answer to is it an acid, is it a base, will just plain and simply be no. Okay? And then what we'll do is we'll go over, once we do that, we'll go over the anions and we'll do that second. The anions tend to do quite a bit more um, than what the cations do, um, simply because they've got that built-in negative charge, which means that they tend to immediately have that, well, they could definitely be a base right off the bat. Okay? So... Um, well, this is kind of how the structure of the video is going to go. Talk about the cations, then we'll get into the anions. Okay, so let's start with the cations. And um, the cations has a list of things that you have to pay attention to. Okay, so I'll first of all write down cations. So the cations have a list of things that are going to... Uh, turn the solution into uh, make it acidic or basic okay so the very first thing is that cations being positively charged for chem 12 do not act as bases okay so like the first thing we have to write down here number one do not act as bases okay, and just by the nature of the fact that they're positively charged and they tend not to add another hydrogen to them okay so uh, you have to have that in your head don't ever try and think that this cation can be a base and picks up an H from somewhere it doesn't uh, number two Better get its formula C6. Okay, so the first thing that we, we want to talk about, the, the category or group of cations that we need to talk about that do something when they're floating around as ions, are the positive ions that are associated with nitrogen. Okay, so one you're super familiar with or should be super familiar with, ammonium, so NH4. So anytime you've got a compound that has NH4 in it, such as, um, let's say, NH4, NO3, so ammonium nitrate. If you take ammonium nitrate and dissolve it into water, it dissociates into two ions. One of those ions, the cation, is NH4 plus 1. NH4 plus 1 is an acid and it can donate an H to water and form hydronium, as we've seen back in the weak acid unit when I was doing that, okay, and you've probably seen that before. So that's one that we have to pay attention to, so that would be a salt that, when it dissociates, has an acid. Another compound, or I guess it's more of a category of compounds, are amines, and so if you have a, an organic compound so carbon-based compound that has a nitrogen group on it. And that nitrogen group happens to have three hydrogens hanging off of it. And that's why this, there's the nitrogen group coming off of this carbon compound. There's the nitrogen group and on attached onto that nitrogen group are three hydrogens. So it's picked up an extra H. 
And so it's got that same kind of basic structure as uh, NH4 does. So NH4 plus one has a nitrogen with one too many hydrogens on it, and that's why it's positive one, and so it can donate it. So any groups that have an NH3 plus one, the fourth bond's going to a carbon that it's attached to, that can be donated as well into water. And so those groups are considered like an acid. Okay, and it's a positively charged ion. So you can have, like if this thing here, which is called aniline, so if you've got this specific compound, you can have something like aniline chloride. Now, you'll probably be told that, like if you're ever asked a question like that, you'd, you'd be told, okay, so you've got aniline chloride that dissociates. It's soluble when you put it into water and it dissociates 100%. Um, the aniline, you wouldn't be expected to know that it has a Ka, but you might be told that it does. And so um, just be aware that there are other kind of crazy giant positively charged ions and that oftentimes they have to do with nitrogen and it's based on that same concept that ammonium has. Ammonium is by far the one that you're going to see more often than not in chemistry 12. Okay, but don't be frightened by those, by the, the other ones, the amines. So NH4 and amines such as this, and I'll put it down here, act as acids. Okay, so NH4 plus in an ionic compound dissociates into water, it's going to act as an acid. And it will make the solution acidic. How acidic kind of depends on what concentration of ammonium you get out of that compound, okay? Which is the quanti quantitative side of things that we're not going into. So that's a category you've got to know. The third category you have to know is an unusual one. This will be the first time you've ever seen it before, um, unless you for some reason you have been searching online or you've heard it somewhere, you've read about it somewhere, um, that there are certain cations that when you have them in solution, they go through a process where they do something and they form a, a hydrated complex ion. Okay, so I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to write down the list so it's up here on the board of the ones you're expected to know in chemistry 12. Okay, so there's only a few that you're expected to know in chemistry 12. There are many that do this, um, some a little bit better than others, but you're talking about a list that's probably, oh, it's in the neighborhood of 20 cations long. Okay, and they all have varying degrees to which they do this. Um, the ones that I'm going to give you tend to do it quite well, so they tend to be the ones that we want to know about. So, they are in no particular order, um, aluminum, iron 3, now iron 2 does this as well, but iron 3 is better at it, and chromium plus 3. So these three cations. So if you have solutions of aluminum, you have solutions of Fe plus 3, if you have solutions of chromium plus 3, if you have these three ions floating around in water, they do something highly unusual. Now there's some other ones that are kind of important too. So copper does it, copper plus 2 does it, uh, calcium plus 2 does it, uh, iron plus 2 does it, like I said earlier. So zinc plus 2 does it. So there's other ones that do this as well and it you'll tend to find that the, oh, how do I describe this? Um, so the positively charged ions, the, the higher the positive charge and the smaller the radius of the ion, meaning the charge density. So if you take lots of positive charge, but you have it over a small volume of the ion. So you'll notice like something like aluminum plus three is actually quite a small little ion from an atomic radius perspective, but it's got plus three charge. So it has quite a high charge density. The things that have this high charge density tend to do what I'm about to describe to you. So these things, first of all, they act as acids. 
just like NH4 plus one, just like ammonium does. So you look at them and you go, <laughs> that is literally an impossibility because it was described earlier as an acid being a chemical that can donate an H plus or a proton to another chemical, which means you had to have a hydrogen to be able to donate a hydrogen. Like if you don't have one, how can you donate one? These things clearly don't have a hydrogen. They are not hydrogen. They don't have one bonded to it. They, it's not like you can pop a hydrogen out of them. Like if that doesn't work, that'd be a nuclear reaction. So how are these things going to chemically donate a proton onto another chemical? Well, what happens is it's kind of like an, there's an intermediate step. So as soon as these things form in solution, so let's pretend you had a solution of aluminum nitrate, okay? So I'll use this guy as an example. So aluminum nitrate. I throw that guy into water and nitrate is soluble with all cations. So you end up getting aluminum ions. Whoops. and three nitrate ions, okay? And they're in both an aqueous solution. Okay, floating around in the water. The aluminum plus three doesn't just sit there and float around in the water. What it tends to do, because it has a small volume and a large positive charge and a high um, charge density, what it does is it attracts a bunch of water molecules, almost like yeah, um, like static electricity. So if you take a whole bunch of styrofoam bits, you've just unpacked a piece of furniture from Ikea and it's all got styrofoam little bits around and the little styrofoam bits stick onto you. Um, the same things here. So the aluminum ion is floating around in the water and little water molecules stick onto it. Don't chemically react with it, stick onto it. And it's actually an electrostatic charge as well. They don't chemically react. They don't form a, like a weird, funky bond. They form, they're attracted because of the opposite charge. And what ends up happening is that aluminum ion does not then float around just as an Al plus three floating around in the water. It floats around as an Al plus three with all the water molecules that are stuck to it, like the styrofoam. They're all stuck and they go around together as a big giant unit. And that thing is known as a hydrated complex ion. So aluminum forms this hydrated complex ion. So does iron plus three, so does chromium plus three. So this thing, it like, it carries on in life to and this is kind of interesting because it doesn't actually chemically react and form a whole, well, I guess, it, I mean, it forms a different looking substance. It forms the complex ion, but it's not like we're breaking bonds and reforming and all that kind of fancy stuff that happens with a collision. This is just, they stick. So they form that thing. So the aluminum now has six water molecules stuck on the outside of it, like styrofoam with static electricity sticking onto you. So imagine you're walking around and you've got these six styrofoam things sticking off of you and they won't let go. That's what the aluminum looks like. It's floating around in the water and it's got six water molecules stuck onto it, kind of floating around and it's like, get off of me. And it, they don't. They just stick around and they, it's like they're one big giant unit. Now, even though they're like the aluminum didn't originally have them, that hydrated aluminum ion now acts as an acid because now there's a whole bunch of H's in there. And so that hydrated complex has H's that it can donate. It just donates one. One of the H's can be donated. The second, third, fourth, third, too weak, they don't come off. So the the thing can get rid of an H. So I need more room. So I'm gonna erase this. We don't really need this. So 
So now what happens is this hydrated aluminum complex bumps into another water molecule because the thing the aluminum complex is floating around like styrofoam stuck on you and then bumps into another water molecule and if it bumps just right this mass of whatever this thing is this clump of awkwardness floating around in the water can bump and give an H to the water molecule making hydronium What does what gets left behind on this thing? So if you kind of stop and you think about, well, okay, if it lost an H, what would it look like? So it, the formula of it's kind of weird. Um, if you happen, if you're in BC and you're using one of these, this actual equation is on here. So aluminum is, so aluminum is, let me come over to this side. Aluminum's right here. And so you can actually see that it's on the other side what it is so you don't have to memorize it but I'll show you so the aluminum still has now it had six water molecules attached to it one of those six has lost an H five are still stuck on unaffected but one of those six has lost an H and so therefore it is now that. But the whole thing has lost an H, so it's gone from plus three, it goes down a charge to plus two, which is kind of a really weird, awkward thing going on there. So you have to imagine that if you had six of those styrofoam balls sticking off of you, one of them lost a little piece you know, off to something else. And that little thing that it lost was a hydrogen and it formed hydronium and so therefore these complex ions can form acidic solutions so if you had a solution of a if you took some aluminum nitrate dissolved it into water it would dissociate into aluminum nitrate the aluminum would form a hydrated complex ion the hydrated complex ion would proceed to produce some hydronium the overall solution would then come out acidic now, that means that aluminum ions, which you wouldn't suspect before, and why would you ever think that aluminum is going to be an acid? It comes out to an acidic solution. Now, some of these complex ions, like, like Fe, for example, Fe plus 3, it's Ka, I think, is something like 10 to the negative 4. So where's the iron, iron one? Iron is, that's 10 to the negative 3. So it's actually, it's relatively strong when you're talking about the weak acid solutions the iron complex ion is quite nasty like it'll actually make pHs you can get them down to you know one and a half two just by having a con high concentration of iron plus three ions dissolved in the water they hydrate and they act as a weak acid so those are kind of they're critical they're they're unusual something new that you haven't seen before but you have to watch out for them Okay, so you're going to have to memorize them. Certainly for Chemistry 12 in British Columbia and wherever you're learning your chemistry, you may or may not need to know a longer list. Maybe you've got a table that has the ones that, that form it, and so therefore you, you check. Um, I expect my students anyways to have those three memorized so that given a solution of them, they know right off the bat, oh, he's trying to trick me. He's got a chromium plus three in there that's going to be an acidic solution. Okay, so that really is all of the cations that you need to know. You need to know certainly ammonium, you certainly need to know aluminum, chromium, and iron plus three, all of them plus three, and then also you should probably know that any of the amines, which are organic compounds that have an NH3 plus one ion in them, they can also act as weak acids okay out there in this, out there in solution so once you know those cations and they can form an acidic solution then you can say okay well if you're not one of those then you can assume they don't do anything okay so cations are never bases those 
that short list of things that I expect you to know, they will form acids. And if you're not one of those, then you do nothing. Okay, so you're either small category of acidic cations or nothing. Now the anions. Anions are way more complex. They, they do way more things. So we will run through kind of the what happens with them. Now the anions are an interesting case because there's a whole bunch of different questions that you have to ask along the way. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a flowchart with a series of questions and I'm going to have the whole board kind of, I'm going to use both sides here, and I'm going to draw this flowchart and then I'll give you an example each time we kind of make a, we ask a question and answer a question, we'll go through the, the two different directions, okay? And then we'll get to, down at the bottom we'll get to well, okay, we've answered all of, here's an example of every single time uh, that question is asked. Here's what it looks like when the answer is yes, and here's what the answer looks like when it's no. Okay, so the anions. Um, so we'll start over here. And I will, oh, I can't spell anion. Let's try that again. Okay. So I'm going to ask the question, does, let me make sure I've got the wording right, does it have a donatable Okay, so does it have a donatable H plus? So, and the answer will be yes or no. Okay, so it will be, you're going to have two different sides to this. Okay, so over here we'll say yes, and over here we'll say no. Okay, so if you've got a donatable hydrogen, Okay, what that means is this. You will see in the actual formula of the anion, you will see that it has an H on the left-hand side. Okay, so for example, if the answer is yes, it will look something like HCO3- minus or H2PO4- minus or uh, HSO3-. Minus. It will start with an H. And it will have a negative charge. Well, it's an anion, so obviously everything that I put up here, on here is going to have a negative charge. But it also has a hydrogen, like it leads with a hydrogen. If the answer was no, it would be something like um, SO4 minus 2, or um, F minus, or uh, PO4 minus 3. So not starting with an H. Okay, so, and that's the type of thing that you would be looking for. You'd be looking for the H. Okay, so if it doesn't have an H, let's deal with those first because they're less compl complicated. So if it doesn't have an H, the next question that you're going to ask is this. Is it the conjugate? of a strong is it the conjugate of a strong acid and again the answer is either oops I didn't do that very well let's do that again The answer is either going to be yes or no. So how do you answer that question? How do you know it's the conjugate of a strong acid? Okay, well if you haven't, if you weren't here during the base discussion at some point, 
usually you have a KA table or your teacher has made you flat out memorize the six strong acids. So the six strong acids are the acids that are up here in the gray zone at the very top of the KA table. And so the reason they're labeled as strong is because they dissociate 100% and they go from left to right 100%, which means they go from right to left 0%. Well, you'll notice over here on this side are the six conjugates of strong acids. So those six, the reason why those are special is because they do not ever go back from right to left back to form the acid, which means they don't do anything. They're not bases because they go 0% and 0% means you're not a base. So that's a critical distinction to make, whether you're the conjugate of a strong or you're conjugate of a weak. So if you are the conjugate of a strong acid, the answer here would be yes. Well, what examples might we have of that? Well, according to the table, we've got six. So something like Cl- minus or nitrate. I, you could just look at the list and you could come up with all six of them, okay? So if you are the conjugate, or sorry, if your negative ion A does not have in a donatable H, so we've come down to here, and it is the conjugate of a strong acid, that means it's not a base. So even though it's got a negative charge, it's not a base. So what will happen is this is a neutral That's a neutral ion, meaning it's a spectator. Okay, so now I shouldn't say that the solution will all automatically come out neutral because maybe the cation is doing something that you don't know about yet. Um, but it's a spectator ion, meaning it does nothing. So it's it's not going to make your solution acidic or basic. It's not going to be the culprit. It will just, it'll keep it neutral, won't do anything, it's spectator, it's sitting back doing nothing. Then obviously you've checked your cation to see if it does anything. Okay, so that's critical that you see this one. So if you have a solution of Cl minuses, or you have a solution of NO3 minuses, or a solution of perchlorate, ClO4 minuses, they are not going to make the solution acidic or basic. They do nothing. If the answer is no, if you ask the question, is this the conjugate of a strong acid? then the other side of that coin would be, then it's the conjugate of a weak acid. And if you're the conjugate of a weak acid, this thing is a base. Now, we're doing a qualitative evaluation here. So no one's asking you, I haven't asked you, what is the pH resulting from that base? Uh, that would be you need numbers, you need a concentration, you need to know a whole bunch of other things, right? So all I'm asking you is, is the solution going to be acidic, basic, or neutral as the result of these ions? So if you're going through the, the anion kind of uh, decision-making process, does it have a donatable H? No. Is it the conjugate of a strong acid? No. Well then, that anion you're talking about is going to be a base. So, I mean, the ones that are up here, all three of those actually are, so PO4 and negative uh, 3, F minus, CH3COO minus, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Like, there's a lot that are not conjugates of strong acids that also don't have a donatable H. So, that's the no side. If you don't have a donatable H, that's that side. Let's come over here to this side to the side where you do have a donatable H. Okay, so the next question you're going to have, you're going to ask is, are you the conjugate, or is it, the conjugate of a strong acid? same question. Okay, so it's almost like in your brain you've got okay, these two questions that are the same, different levels. So the first one is, do you have a donatable H? The next question you're going to ask, no matter what, to the anion, are you the conjugate of a strong acid? Because that's a critical thing. So if you are, okay, I'm going to 
I need a lot of room here. So I'm going to go with no and yes. Okay, so are you the conjugate of a strong acid? If your answer to this question is yes, like it, or yes, and you're at this stage, so you've asked the question, does it have a donatable H? Yes. So it's got an H on the left-hand side. Are you the conjugate of a strong acid? Yes. Well, there's only one thing that's out there in the universe that is A, has a donatable H, and is the conjugate of a strong acid. So right here, this is not a category of things. This is a thing. This is, it's HSO4 minus. Like, that's what you must have. If you say yes to both of those questions, you are HSO4 minus. And if you're HSO4 minus, that thing is an acid. Why is it an acid? I don't even have to check to see if it's a base. Well, it's the conjugate of a strong acid. And when you're the conjugate of a strong acid, you never act as a base, as we just went through. So if it's got a donatable H but can't act as a base, then it must just be an acid. That's all it is. Okay, it's only one thing. So then we go to the other branch here, which this makes life way more, e way more difficult. So if you have a donatable H and you are uh, the conjugate of a weak acid, okay, that means... You are that means you are amphiprotic. Okay, that's kind of the category that you belong into. You are amphiprotic. And at this point, it's not necessarily asking a question, which of course we could just we could put it into the form of asking a question. But at this point, to determine if an amphiprotic chemical acts as an acid or a base. As we learned back in episode 11, I believe it was, um, to determine if an amphiprotic chemical species acts as an acid or a base predominantly, which is a key word, predominantly, it doesn't mean exclusively, it means you do that more than you do the other one, you check its Ka and its Kb, right? So once you get to this stage right here, it's kind of like an if question. So if Ka is bigger than Kb, oops, I use the same format as everything else. You are an acid. And if your Ka is less than your Kb, then you're talking base. So an amphiprotic chemical has a donatable H and is the conjugate of a weak acid, not a strong, a weak acid, then that means that it could potentially be an acid or a base. You don't really know. So you have to check numerically to determine what it actually is. And so you compare Ka to Kb. And so if you look at the ends of all of these, like the decision-making tree, that it ends in a certain category of solution. It's acidic, it's basic, it's, it's neutral type of thing. So um, if you were to combine this with what goes through your head with the cation as well, because you're asking the cation similar questions, not quite as intense as this, but you're asking the same kind of thing. So when you go through these things, when you combine, you go through it with a cation and you say, okay, so one, it's never going to be a base. The cation can only be acidic or nothing. And it's acidic if it's ammonium, iron plus three, chromium plus three, or aluminum plus three, or happens to be one of those amines that I was talking about. Then it's acidic. The cation makes the solution acidic. If it's not one of those, then it's a spectator. The cation would be a spectator and float around and do nothing. The anion then, you kind of move once you've decided what to do with the cation, you then go over to the anion and say to yourself, okay, does it have a donatable H? Yes or no? Is it the conjugate of a strong acid? Yes or no? And that leads you to certain things. So it, the only one where you ask a, a 
further question is if you happen to find that the chemical, the anion that you have is amphiprotic. And if it comes out being amphiprotic, you have to compare K to KB to determine what it actually does in the water, whether it's going to be an acid or a base. But it leads you to those things. And so you will have, and let me give you some examples of amphiprotics where um, some will be acid and some will be base. Okay, so um, I'll walk through a couple of them. What I want to do is I actually want to erase this side of the board to give myself a little bit more space to actually put, put up some numbers here. Okay, so Okay, so let's pretend I'm, I've just answered this. I have, a don I have an anion that has a donatable H and is not the conjugate of a strong acid. So it's anything but HSO4 minus. So uh, it could be HSO3 minus. It could be HPO4 minus 2. It could be H2. PO4 minus. It could be H C6 H5 uh, O7 minus 2. Um, it could be H C2 O4 minus. Da, 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 da. Like you get sick and tired of talking about all the amphiprotic things that are out there. There's a lot of amphiprotic things. So all five of those would fit into this category. You'd be following them down here, right? And then you'd be saying, oh, geez. So now I've got these amphiprotic things. They've got donatable H's. And, but they could also act as a weak base because they're the conjugate of a weak acid. So how do I figure it out? So what you do is you take your chemical and you say, what's its Ka? What's its Kb? So I'll just use this one right here. So what is its Ka? So what is its Ka? I get my trusty Ka table and I find hydrogen oxalate. So hydrogen oxalate is 6.4 times 10 to the negative 5. Okay, not bad, not bad. Now I need its Kb. So it's Kb equals, and this is how you, like previous knowledge from the acid base unit really kind of helps. How do you determine something's Kb and how do you do it fairly quickly? Well, it's Kw divided by the Ka of the conjugate acid of HC2O4 minus 1. Now, the conjugate acid is always the chemical that you have when this thing has an H put back on it. Okay, so you're kind of asking, okay, so the Kb of this thing is if it was acting as a base, it would pick up an H and form its conjugate acid. Okay, and so that would be H2C2O4 in this case. Well, that's ox oxalic acid, so that would be H2C2O4. Well, that is 1 times 10 to the negative 14. And oxalic acid has a Ka of 5.9 times 10 to the negative 2, uh, which is going to equal, I'm not going to pull out the calculator, I think I can do this one in my head because this is about 1/6. And I'm pretty sure it's 1 times 1.7 times 10 to the negative 13. So you've got, now you've got a K and a KB. So now you say to yourself, which one is bigger? So Ka is bigger than Kb. It's actually significantly bigger than Kb. So it's not even a, it's not even a, a contest here. So I'm fitting into this category. HC2O4- minus fits into this category here. Okay? So let me give you... Um, I'll do one more where it goes the other way around. So that was this guy. Let's go with this guy. So that is monohydrogen citrate. So Ka is of monohydrogen citrate is monohydrogen citrate. Where am I? 
4.1 times 10 to the negative 7. I think I picked the wrong one. I picked the wrong one. Get rid of that guy. Let's go with this guy. So monohydrogen phosphate. Let's, let's go with monohydrogen phosphate. The other guy was the K was going to be bigger than the KB again. So this guy, monohydrogen phosphate, has a Ka of 2.2 times 10 to the negative 13. Its KB is going to equal KW divided by the Ka of its conjugate. So put an H back on. And that's H2PO4, which I read off the table. W divided by dihydrogen phosphate has a Ka of 6.2 times 10 to the negative, uh, where'd it go? 10 to the negative 8, uh, which equals, again, I think I can do that one when I, in my head, 1.5 times 10 to the negative 7. So now you've got Kb is bigger than the K, is bigger than the Ka. So you've got this situation, and so this one would be a base because its Kb is bigger than its Ka. Now, of course, you can sometimes have these things like so on the tip of your tongue because you've seen them so many times that you know one's acidic, one's basic. But the proof is the Ka versus the Kb. So if I gave a compound such as, okay, so let's just like a practical situation. So um, what are we doing here? We're doing that guy. So. Okay, so let's say you're in the lab and your um, teacher hands you this bottle of sodium monohydrogen phosphate. And they say to you, okay, well, I want you qualitatively, don't give a number what the pH would be, I don't care about that. Is this solution expected to be acidic, basic, or neutral? What would you say? Your brain, and maybe you would do it on paper, your brain would separate it into its sodium ions and its monohydrogen phosphate ions. From that, you would then go through each ion and say, okay, sodium, positive ion can never be a base, so that's not even in the question. It's a positive ion. Is it one of those that I have to be concerned about being an acid? It's not ammonium. It's not iron, it's not chromium, it's not aluminum. So it's one that doesn't do anything. So I would label this guy as a spectator. Like the sodium's just gonna float around doing nothing. It doesn't contribute to a solution being acidic or basic. HPO4 negative two. Well, you would then go through and maybe you could do it in your head. Maybe you could, you could guesstimate off of the Ka table, or maybe you actually have to write it down and actually go through the calculation. The Ka is this and the Kb is this and oh the Kb is bigger than the Ka. But in the end you would say that that ion makes the solution basic because its Kb is bigger than its Ka. So a solution that is sodium monohydrogen phosphate should have an, a basic or alkaline pH to it. What that value would be is kind of dependent upon the concentration that you would have. Okay, which is the quantitative side of things, which maybe your teachers are, are pushing you towards. Now, that's kind of the general kind of idea. Like there's this whole kind of series of questions you ask about each ion to determine if you're talking about an acidic, basic, or neutral solution. When we come back next class, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a list of, um, I think I've got seven, maybe eight chemicals. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, we're going to put them on a, on a pH scale in terms of if I had equal molar solutions of all of these things and you were to test the pH, like you put a pH meter in, 
which one would have the lowest pH, which one would have the highest pH, and put everything else somewhere in between in their proper order. Now, I said equimolar, which means that their initial concentrations are the same. So where you put them is going to be based upon Ka, Kb, how acidic, how basic, maybe it's neutral, and then you put them all in order. And it's kind of a good test of do you understand that concept of hydrolysis and um, kind of general categorization of acid and base, and then also the strength of something based on its uh, Ka versus its Kb, okay? So next class, we'll see you then for a little bit more of that hydrolysis work. Okay, so good one. We'll see you later.